Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you very much for um, coming to listen to me talk about governance and the Great Reset. This is obviously going to be framed around AI and it's a particular honor and privilege to be able to speak to you all in Africa, wherever you are and beyond in the world. So thanks to Nick for inviting me. So I'd like to start this speech with um, some comments uh, from Professor Klaus Schwab. He is the founder and chairman of the World Economic Forum for whom I work. And um, he has said recently that the great reset is necessary because of the so we need a social contract that honors the dignity of every human being. And as you can see from this slide, he helps us to notice that the global health crisis has laid bare the unsustainability of the old system of social cohesion. It shows the lack of equal opportunities and inclusiveness of racism and discrimination. And so we need to really think about how we build a new social contract which is intergenerational and lives up to the expectations of young people. In Africa, you've got a lot of young people. And so I think it's particularly appropriate when you're thinking about how you use AI to benefit everybody and think about that inclusiveness and those equal opportunities for everyone across the continent. COVID has accelerated our transition into the age of the fourth industrial revolution and those technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, need to be made to serve society as a whole and remain human centered. So you'll hear me talk about human centered AI and you'll probably have heard it elsewhere. I think that the important piece as well is we need to make sure that everyone has fair access to a technology that is inevitably going to change our world. And so that doesn't just mean as individuals, it also means as individuals, countries and um, bodies of the world. So at the moment, the global north has the technology and the global south is striving to catch up. And so we want to make sure that we think about artificial intelligence as benefiting the whole world, um, humans and the rest of the um, species that we live with. And so I want to start this uh, talk by talking about AI and the Harry Potter problem. You'll be aware, I think, that AI is almost has mystical or magical properties. So people say, oh, we'll be able to solve climate change with AI, for example. Um, that's just not true. And it gets in the way of a reasonable and sensible conversation about artificial intelligence. And so I would like you to think more of if it is magic, or if it is going to offer us something hugely beneficial, which I believe it will, then we need to be like Harry. We need to think about taking ourselves back to the very beginning and reading the books and studying and practicing and testing our abilities because the, a good AI, beneficial AI, doesn't just happen because governments throw money at it or because companies throw money at it. We actually need to build some firm foundations around the use of AI so that it is beneficial and it doesn't just end up in a car crash. So one of the great things about the work that you're doing in Africa is that you start from a fairly blank sheet. Um, in that there you are growing at the moment your indigenous AI uh, in, and perhaps have an opportunity to really think about the ethical issues around AI at this stage, not 
and trying to retrofit it as we're perhaps trying to do in the global, uh, global north. So when you're thinking about AI and how you continue to build it and be successful with it, first of all, your countries need infrastructure, the infrastructure of AI, so the compute power of AI. And then you need to build these foundations for success. I always say that with ethical AI and governance of artificial intelligence, we aren't impeding innovation. We're just making that innovation safe and sustainable so that we can benefit from AI whilst mitigating the negativities. And so you shouldn't be starting on the AI journey without first having that ethical foundation. People say to me, well, startups, they don't need an ethical foundation. They won't get startup, they won't get money. And I say, well, why would you um, allow any part of the AI sector to grow without ethical considerations? Because when they get to be a big company, they will need ethical considerations. Um, do you really want them selling artificial intelligence that is unethical? Do you want them undercutting the big companies that are trying to um, pursue an ethical course? Uh, what sort of infrastructure, company infrastructure are you, are you building if everybody has a different perspective and different rules to live to? So that's particularly important in the in what we're seeing in the uh, global north around backlash so you have the opportunity to look at what's going wrong in the global north and solve it for the global south so that actually you can probably forge ahead um that backlash is something that i'll talk about a little bit more and we'll try and unpick but first, I want to talk to you because many of you are leaders in business or government. And the thing about AI is that you have to make real decisions and, and exercise inalienable duties to understand and manage strategic strategies and risks, even though the technologies that make up AI are complex, opaque, unregulated, and not easy to evaluate or oversee in real world settings. And I thank um, our Global AI Council member, Karen Silverman, for that very succinct way of putting the problems that face business leaders with AI. And so your opportunity, if you're using, thinking about using AI is you're going to get improved efficiency, improved accuracy, and new insights into the data that you've got. But you might pay severely for that because your risks are business continuity. So if you buy the wrong AI or you develop the wrong AI, you're going to make hit barriers, uh, reputational risks through hidden inaccuracies, bias, unanticipated outcomes, and inexplicable autonomous decision-making. So that's the black box, for example. It might also be uh, the much spoken about problems with the algorithm that decided the A-level results in the UK just recently. What a mess, because um, the, that's inevitably causing a lot of backlash against artificial intelligence that puts us back um, and away from our goal of really using AI for all to benefit all. So I said I'd come back to backlash or tech clash as we were calling it. Um, in 2019, we were talking about it a lot. We talked about it at Davos in early 2020. And the predictions of PwC in 2020 were actually that whereas in 2019 they thought that companies 20 percent of companies would be using ai across various verticals by the 2020 predictions and this is pre-covid 
they were talking about only 4% of companies using it sector, uh, across all sectors and verticals in the companies. So what happened there? Partly, I think, companies woke up to the fact that there was this tech clash about and that possibly frightened them and they didn't know how to go forward um, in, a, in a managed way. There's also, I think, a, an issue about how much data companies actually can use and have AI used across. And so perhaps you see a proof of concept in AI, which then doesn't go anywhere else, not because it's a bad proof of concept, but simply because there isn't the data in the organization. And so that I think is something that you um, all across Africa really need to think about. Data first, you've got to get your data right, because if you don't get your data right, you aren't going to be able to use AI at all. So it's not even at the junk in, junk out. It's just, do you have machine readable data? The second thing I think that we should um, be thinking about is this Gartner study that projects that through 2022, 85% of AI projects will deliver erroneous outcomes because of bias in the data the algorithms or the teams responsible for managing them. So when you're thinking about AI and Africa, you need to make sure that you have diverse teams. And one of the problems of purchasing AI from outside Africa is that probably those teams are not made up of people who are diverse within the African diaspora. Um, and so then you may well find that the algorithm doesn't fit you. In fact, no algorithms fit everybody. And that goes back to we need diverse teams, creating them, managing them, and using data that is appropriate for the algorithm that we are creating. One of the problems that we also have is the male-female balance amongst developers of AI. Only 22% of the AI profession um, were found to be um, female in um, 2018 when we did our survey. And so what does that mean? That means that there is a problem even before you start with the other problems that I've just enunciated. So, I want to go back to this AI ethics and why it's so important. So a very short history. DeepMind was the first organization when it was selling itself to Google to say, we are worried about ethical issues in deep learning. And so we would like to create an ethics advisory panel. They did that, um, but they didn't talk about who was on it at that stage. Stephen Hawking also came out that year on the 1st of May 2014 and said that artificial intelligence could be the best thing that humanity ever did, or it could be our last thing that we did. And obviously that's a huge warning from somebody very respected in the scientific community. In 2015, 12 of us got together to start the IEEE's ethically aligned design work, which over the last few years has really grown into a template for a lot of the way that we think about artificial intelligence ethics. And if you go away doing one or two things today, one of them I would suggest is to read the AI ethically aligned design work, and the other would be to read the work that we're doing at the um, forum which really takes the takes the, the thought leadership and operationalizes it. We then um, uh, about 120 of us um, gathered at Azlamar to come up with the first ethical principles for artificial intelligence and um, I find it hard to believe that it was only in 2015 that I actually coined the AI ethics Twitter hashtag. We've come a long way in that time, 
but now I think that we're seeing that we haven't come far enough and every company, however big or small it is, needs these ethical foundations because 175 plus different organizations around the world have created ethical principles now. Of those, these are the 10 most common. I often, because I work on a global basis, get asked, who's ethics anyway? Well, they're the ethics that fit your country, fit your company, fit your world. But these 10 most common ones come up. If you look at all those 175, all of these are in there. You might interpret them differently, but everybody's worried about fairness. Everyone's worried about bias. Everybody's worried about security and, and all these other things as well. So, there are a number of international organizations globally doing the work. Obviously, the forum, I, I will tell you a bit more about the work that we do in a moment. But there's OECD, the, the Global Partnership on the AI, there's the UNESCO's work, the G20's work, the UN Secretary General's work the European Commission's work, and many countries with national AI strategies. And so I think it's increasingly obvious that you working in the AI space can't ignore all work that's happening all around you internationally. And not only can't, but actually you should not ignore it because we're providing foundations which have really been built out of understanding how we got it wrong. So I also have got an illustrative sample and I'm not calling out any of these companies as brilliant and you should follow them. I just want to put it in an illustrative sample because you know these are the companies that have been the cutting edge of um, the work around responsible AI and the cutting edge of some of the backlash against AI. And so the very fact that they have gone on to some of them early on create ethical principles, some of them later on, not just ethical principles, but operational ways, ways of operationalizing those ethical principles is really important for you, especially if you're a startup or a small and medium sized enterprise to really be thinking through what are you going to do um, with your artificial intelligence to make sure you don't have problems as you grow. So the World Economic Forum's work um, at the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution is multi-stakeholder governance of AI. And you'll see that I've spelt that word governance with a small g. And that's because we see governance um, as not regulation, but very many other types of governance as, as well. What we do is we bring countries, companies, academia and civil society together to really work on operationalizing those AI ethical principles so that we can have the world benefiting from AI and we mitigate the negativities. It's a co-creation exercise and it takes up to 18 months, but it can be shorter than that. So we scope, we co-create, we um, pilot, and then we scale. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So joining us, we would really love to welcome more African companies into our work. So. Um, AI at weforum.org. Um, you can join our, your companies can join our work with obviously certain um, conditions. And uh, we're very pleased to welcome employees of yours as fellows of ours. So do reach out to me if you're interested. So I said we don't think of governance as regulation, we actually think of it as agile governance. So everything from norms and consultations and self-regulation through to actual regulations by government. So you will see that we're only thinking about that perhaps in the facial recognition area. So 
how many people does it take to do global governance? Well, actually a world. That, so although we have lots of people um, working with us, and in fact, there should be a star on South Africa as well, um, we have affiliate centers so far in Africa, in South Africa and Rwanda. And then it takes a few more people in the world as well. So you can see it's a really multi-stakeholder group that we bring together to do this work on agile governance of artificial intelligence. And we really focus on three areas. And I'd like you, when you're examining your own AI, to think about, you know, where do you fit? Do you fit in enabling frameworks? So building artificial intelligence frameworks that will benefit a country or a company or a piece of society. Do you work in this high risk area, for example, facial recognition or the use of algorithms in hiring? Or are you working, and probably you are, in some of these wonderful leapfrogging opportunities? How do we use AI to educate people? Or how do we use AI to deliver healthcare um, to those people who cannot otherwise get education or healthcare? Um, so I will talk you through the projects that we're doing, or some of them. There are many, and um, there are, will be many more. It's important that we try to cover as many things as possible. As I say, so we put those firm foundations in to let you succeed in the work that you're doing. I mentioned earlier, please read some of the things that we have been doing because it'll help you when you're framing your own questions to ask around your AI systems. So there are some white papers out there, but also there's quite a lot of literature through interviews that we've done and um, also just write to me and I will send you all the other pieces of, of work that we're doing as well and more information about it. So first of all, we, are, we want to empower people to use AI wisely. So we created a board toolkit which had has 13 different segments of the way that boards should look at AI. Because many boards were being asked to sign off on artificial intelligence without having the skills to understand just what artificial intelligence was, let alone how it would affect their company. And so I encourage you to have a look at that because the, append the appendices <coughs> have a large number of questions that you yourselves might want to ask as you're thinking of building your company, as you're thinking of going to venture capital, as you're thinking of growing your company. And we're currently working on a C-suite version of that toolkit because we know also that many members of C-suite don't understand AI as well as they should do when they're making purchasing or r and decisions. The public sector also needs to have ideas about how they, they buy artificial intelligence and use it. So we worked with the UK government to create procurement uh, guidelines, which are now being used by other countries around the world. Um, so they, again, if you're thinking about selling to governments or you're just thinking about what are the best practices we should be using because a government near us might start using this? Then go to this piece of work. Likewise, responsible limits on facial recognition. That's been in the news so much at the moment. Um, if you're using facial recognition technology, you may want to think about um, joining this work or at least following this work because. Um, it's a, it's a truly hot topic. It's a place where you can get things very badly wrong and be on the receiving end of that tech clash. The reimagining regulation in the age of AI is a project that we're doing with New Zealand government, thinking about centers of excellence for AI 
having what we call a public conversation around AI. And it may be that some of you in different countries throughout the African continent should be having those public conversations. What do you want out of your AI? How, for example, do you think about the jobs that AI will take or create? And what is your, um, what, what's the diversity within your country? Do you have a lot of young people, for example? Do you have any training available for those young people? Should you be pointing them to the, in the direction of some, a company like Fast AI or Coursera, or the way that Google has created its own, ha, have said, you can work for us if you get these qualifications. Maybe you want to be saying that as your own company to encourage young Africans to become co cognizant and conversant with artificial intelligence. So you build your own ecosystem and you're not buying it in. We also have a project around using AI in human resources. This is not a high risk case. Uh, the Europe is likely to legislate both on this use case and facial recognition next year. So watch for that. Um, and so what are the best practices? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you tools that you can use within your companies so you can succeed. Catbots. One of the things that we've obviously noticed with COVID is that suddenly chatbots are there. Um, they're learning more, they're being used more, and we as humans are becoming more able to, more comfortable with using them. What we want to do with chatbots um, is really try to reach those patients who have no access to medical care at all. Can we use a chatbot even to do the very most basic triage work um, and provide healthcare to a large segment of the world that doesn't currently have it? For me, this is the dream of AI, and um, it's always how do we make sure that we have these ethical and foundational underpinnings so that we can achieve that dream. Responsible use of technology. Again, you know, if you're a technology company, if you're using AI, if you're a company that is using AI but isn't a technology company, uh, you need to know some things. You need to know about how to responsibly use the technology, how to make sure that you're a whole company understands responsible use of AI and how to follow that product from the moment that it's an idea in your engineer's mind, surrounding them with a multi-stakeholder team and taking that project forward until it's out of the door. And sometimes with AI beyond when it's out of the door. Generation AI, I guess, is my personal favorite because I think that we, should, we can bring such value to the world if we can educate everybody and AI holds that potential. But also AI can be very pernicious in the wrong hands and we have to be very, very careful how we pre protect our children whilst also empowering them to use these fantastic tools. And so we've got a number of projects within Generation AI. One of them is working with UNICEF on some principles, and another is working on the AI Youth Council, bringing young people from around the world together to talk about AI. And the third is, how do we make sure that the smart toys that people buy their children are not ethically challenged and do do what they say on the box. They're creative or educational. And although that seems as if it's probably just a first world problem, I, it's, it's not because if we get it right for the toys, then we can get it right for education um, uses of AI. So we can put those underpinnings in now. Um, 
We also have some work being done around um, how do you take a national AI strategy and operationalize it. So operationalizing these ethics is key to the work that we do. And that's some work being done in India. And then we like to think about, well, what will the future look like? And so we have some work bringing together economists, AI scientists, business, governments, and sci-fi writers to think about what are the futures that we want to actually create for ourselves and how do we get there? How do we get back up into that future um, by creating the right policy mechanisms now? So finally, I, you remember I've talked about a whole lot of things, a whole lot, lot of countries doing things, international organizations doing things, companies doing things. And so the whole point of the Action Alliance is to bring, try to bring everybody together there's so much to do, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, we need to work together. And so that's why I end by saying, if you're interested, we really want to work with you, or you probably want to work with either our South African affiliate or our Rwandan affiliate. So please do reach out to me. It's been an utter pleasure and privilege to talk to you. And um, I want personally to see Africa, the whole continent, going on a positive journey towards really benefiting from artificial intelligence. Thank you.